Hi, everybody. Welcome to the January Pressbooks uh, product update. I'm Steele Wagstaff, the product manager from Pressbooks. And I want to start by kind of talking through some of the things that we've released since the last time we all met together. The first thing that we wanted to share and show, I guess, is um, we made a change. It's kind of a smaller change, but it's a change that, uh, that improves the uh, login experience for people who have Pressbooks accounts, but don't yet have books. So in the case that you've been added to your Pressbooks network, but don't have a role in a book, now when you log in, there will still be an admin link in the main dashboard. When you click the admin link, it will just take you to the basically empty Pressbooks dashboard that shows your user account and will invite you to create a new book or to take some other action. Um, so it's a bit more like a graceful ex fallback experience where the user doesn't have an account or has an account but doesn't have books. So I can't, I'm not going to really show that, but just know that that will happen. Um, we could demo it later if you really want to see it. Another change we made has been a long time coming. Uh, it took us a little bit longer than we hoped to get it shipped, but it's a language change primarily. It doesn't change functionality, but it's an important one. There's a couple places in the Pressbooks interface where we previously had used the term whitelist, um, and we changed that to, to say allow list. Uh, we don't want to use the language that could have potentially racially coded connotations. So if you look at the network settings, you'll see there's an iframe allow list. Anyway, any place that we refer to it in our documentation, we're going to be calling it an allow list. Um, and you can see that it's using allow list here. The functionality is the same. It's just the name change. The other place that that occurred was in the, if you're using the old LTI 1.1 plugin, there's an LTI registration allow list. And you can see that the term is allow list throughout. So uh, not a functionality change, but an important language change. If there are other things like that that you notice throughout the Pressbooks interface that you think should be changed, please let us know. And we'd like to make um, the software and the interfaces uh, more inclusive and better representative of the values that the community holds. So those are some changes that we made there. Another thing that we did was we fixed a bug that a few of you had reported to us. So if you go to, um, so here's an example. If I'm on an individual book on a Pressbooks network and I click sign in from the book, I'll come to a sign in page. And previously, if you had clicked the lost your password link from the book sign in page, it would have taken you to a page not found error. Now, when you click it, it takes you to the lost password page that was expected. Um, it had always worked if you had come to the network home and clicked sign in and reset your password, that always worked. But there was briefly a bug where if you had gone from a a book homepage and tried to sign in, it gave you a page not found error and that was confusing for some people. That's now been fixed. And so you can reset your password from a book login page as well. Um, another change that we made that some of you will uh, have noticed is for a while, some of you had noticed that your catalogs weren't working properly. Like, so if you came into your, a, a book catalog and you filtered by subject, the particular subject headings, you're supposed to be able to filter by them. And that had been broken for some of your networks. Um, we made a change and it was it had to do with how the book info was being stored and we fixed that change. Something to know, however, is that if you cloned books between September 30th and January 20th, they might have bad subject headings in book info. So I can show you kind of what you could look for there. Um, I'm gonna come to the integrations network. I'll find a book that was created between those dates. Oops. Uh, I should have had this ready ahead of time. Okay, so I'll come in and I'll find a book from my book list. Let's look at one that was created between those dates that I think is a clone. Um, so, okay, for example, this book here was cloned uh, in January. So when I go and visit this particular book dashboard and I look at book info, I suspect that what I'm going to see is this primary subject field may be broken or might not be working properly. So you can reset it and you can set it back to history. Uh, let's say it's history of art. You may also notice that the additional subjects are broken. In some cases it's broken, but it's like invisible which one that's broken. So you might just have to add an extra one. So you might say like um, Canadian, I'll just say Canary Islands. And then you would see one that could be removed when you save it. Hopefully it will save correctly. Occasionally it will show you like an error message, come back to the page and save it again. And it will save this, the updated subject heading. That demonstration wasn't perfect and it wasn't great, but you may run into that issue where you see that the subject heading was corrupted because 
it was cloned while that bug was in place. We're going to see if there's a way that we can kind of fix that automatically for people. But in the meantime, that's something to keep an eye out for. It should only affect books that were cloned basically October, November, December. Um, but that's something that we're aware of and we're looking at the, um, the problem there. So I see there's a question in the chat regarding the first update. If the user has been added to a book but hasn't gotten an invite email to that book, will that show up for them in a new way when they log in now? Um, Laura, I don't think so, but I'm not sure I understand the use case. Usually if they've, um, if they've been invited to join a book, there's an action they need to take via email and then mm -hmm. they'll be added to the book. You can uncheck that, you can skip that though, Steele. Yeah, so you can force add them. If they're force added, it'll just show up in their in their catalog when they when they're entered when they're added. Um, but okay. nothing nothing's different about the dashboard. So if a user has been added to the, okay, let me try to step back. Mm -hmm. My understanding is if a user has been added to the Pressbooks network, they have a user account that's created. They have been invited to a book but have not accepted the invitation. Nothing will be different about the Pressbooks dashboard when they log in. Um, they'll still have a pending invitation out there that they'll need to accept via email. There's not a prompt on the dashboard that shows them an outstanding invitation. That's a really interesting feature idea. Maybe we could work with you on that. Um, okay, so that was what I want to talk about with the subject headings. Um, the other things, I don't really have much to show, but we made a number of changes and improvements to the LTI provider and especially the LTI 1.3 provider tool. The LTI 1.3 provider tool is the thing that we're using for that results for LMS feature. So we were doing a pilot with a couple of instructors and they gave us some feedback. So we've just been making enhancements and improvements to make the, the grade pass back part work better. The big thing to announce there though, is that can, the Canvas LMS has improved their handling for thin common cartridges using the LTI 1.3 connection. So what's really nice about that is now you, there's a seamless upgrade path. If you had been previously using LTI 1.1 and would like to move to the LTI 1.3 or turn on the grade reporting feature, the Canvas upgrade path is seamless and smooth and works much better. So the LTI links previously weren't working with Canvas. Canvas has pushed some code over the winter that now makes it work. And so those of you that are using Canvas and the LTI, you can now use 1.3 really well with Canvas and it's kind of working as we hoped and expected it would. That wasn't a Pressbooks change, but we did work with Canvas to improve that performance. Um, we also, some of you are institutions that use the uh, uh, plugin for multilateral SSO. This is only gonna be relevant if you're a consortium, but since Rama and Lillian are on the call at eCampus Ontario, this is something that we've spent a lot of time working on with you. Thanks for your patience. We made a bunch of improvements to how we handle this multilateral SSO. Um, so if many institutions wanna log into one Pressbooks network with their individual uh, single sign-on accounts, that works a lot better. And we've added a feature that logs those attempts. So um, I can show you, I guess, uh, let me go to a network that has this and I'll show you in the back end kind of what it looks like. Um, this is helpful for us mainly in debugging. You won't likely see it much on your side, but um, let me actually turn the plugin on first and then I'll show you. So give me a second. Uh, I haven't shared my screen yet, I don't think. Okay. So let me share my screen here. What you would see is, uh, okay, this is what Pressbooks sees. So we have an allow list for the different domains that get allowed. And we also are now logging login attempts. So this is helpful for us when, when an institution is first setting up their identity provider, we wanna make sure that the claims that we're getting are what we expect and we can debug them. So now we can just generate a CSV file and it will show all of the login attempts with the attribute information. It just makes it a lot easier for you and us to set up and work those configurations out. We went from taking a couple of weeks for each school to kind of get it figured out when we first started with eCampus and now we can pretty much do it in a day or less. Um, and Rama has been a saint, very patient on that. Thank you, Rama, you've been awesome. Um, so that was a change for OIDC. If you're doing multilateral SSO, we're pretty confident and we feel really good about how that's working now. A couple of things to note, if you're an open source Pressbooks user, I'm not sure how many of you are on the call, but in just in case, two changes that are pretty important. One is the latest release of Pressbooks requires you to run PHP 7.3 on your server or later. 
and we're also requiring WordPress 5.5.3 or later. So just that's in the release notes, but just know you're, you might need to upgrade your server or the version of PHP running on your server. And the second note is that we built an optional integration with an application monitoring tool called Sentry. What Sentry does is it allows anytime a user experiences a bug or an error in the front end or in the back end, it will lock, you can direct it to send those errors to a Sentry monitoring application. We're doing that for the Pressbooks networks that we host just so that we can catch bugs faster and fix them faster. If you're hosting your own version of Pressbooks, you can set up something similar and we've added documentation for how to do it in the latest release notes. Uh, that's pretty kind of developer technical. So I don't imagine there's a ton of questions from this general group, but if there are, I'm happy to take them. Um, those are the kind of Pressbooks and Pressbooks app related features that I wanted to share. I'll pause briefly and take any questions about those or other things before I jump into the directory part of the, the meeting. Okay, no questions. So the next thing I want to show is the biggest, the thing that we spent the most amount of time working on since we talked last has been the Pressbooks directory. So that was our latest thing. We released the Pressbooks directory. We're really excited. The coolest thing that we want to show is if you go to pressbooks.directory, you'll see a couple of changes that we've made. One of them is that we're now linking to our guide for how to use the directory. So we've written a really detailed guide chapter that explains a lot of the things that I explained verbally in our last meeting. Um, Sorry, give me a second. Uh, I'm sharing my screen. Is it, is, okay, good. So here you'll see in our guide, we have a chapter that explains, here's what the directory looks like. Here's how you can use the search bar. So there's some kind of detailed stuff about using the search bar. The search bar exists right here and you can search all of book metadata in the directory using that search bar. So there's some explanations for the search bar and some of the parameters and queries if you want to really dig in for some of your Boolean operators and other kind of library and type things, we have some instructions for the search bar. The other thing to note is that once you perform a search, so if I were to search film, you'll notice that we're seeing 41 of the 2000 results. The first one is that great Berkeley book about love narratives in East Asian literature and film. And you also now have a search query that you can save and share and send to other people. This will return the live results of that query anytime. The second thing that we're going to explain to you how to do is how to use the filters. So you'll notice that we made a bunch of changes to the filters. We've reordered them so that the most important filters we think will appear at the top. These filters can be expanded and you can apply filters. So for example, I might want to say, I want to exclude any book that is all rights reserved. I only want to see CC license books. So this is the exclude option. Now this list is showing me all of the books in the directory that have only CC licenses and that have the word film in the title. So I can now see that these refinements have been applied. My search query has changed so this you all return different results. I could remove the word film from my search and research and now it's gonna search everything but without the all rights reserved books. I can then combine filters. So I could say, I also wanna search by subject. I only want books that don't have a subject applied and I wanna look at books from a given network and I could start applying these filters together. So you can see I can make pretty complex facets and filters. And this at the top will show me all of the active filters that are applied. I can remove them one at a time or all at a time by clicking the clear refinements. As I apply those facets and filters, this URL is changing. And that URL is just remembering all of the parameters that I've applied for my facets and filtering. So this will kind of operate a lot like the subject catalogs or the you know, you have those academic search databases that have a lot of the faceting filtering. The Pressbooks directory now supports a lot of those things. There is a clear filter button. So for example, if I only wanted to clear the network filter, I could click clear filter and that would apply all of the network filters that I applied, but leave other filters that I had put in place. So um, one thing that you may want to do is you may want to look and see, okay, what I only want to see the books that are showing up from my Pressbooks network. The easiest way to do that is to come under the network tab and say, okay, what's the name of my, so Amy in the chat asked this question. So I might start looking for Open Oregon. And I say, okay, cool. Open Oregon has 61 books in the directory. If I apply this filter, 
here I'm getting, I'm able to see all of the Open Oregon books that are that the directory is including, and I can look through these and say, are these the books that I actually want to show up? Maybe at some point I say, oh, you know what? Beginning Excel. Wait a minute, that's a that book shouldn't be in the directory. We want to remove that, and so I could go visit Beginning Excel. If I wanted to, I could come in and I could say, uh, for the individual book, come to settings, sharing and privacy. And I could say, actually, yeah, let's remove that book from the directory for right now. And I could change that setting. So that's a, a, a tool that's available to you as network managers to kind of quickly take a look at what's in the directory for you. If you remove a book from the directory using that sharing and privacy setting, that will happen instantaneously. The book will be taken out of the directory right away. If you change your mind and put it back in the directory, it will happen. We re-index those things every hour on the hour. So it won't come back into the directory until the next time we run our sync, which is every hour on the hour. Um, so that's a little bit about what you can do to kind of drill down and look at, see what, what books are available for you. A couple other features you may want to know about is that you can change the number of books per page. So in, in case of 60 books, I could show 50 at a time. And you can also change the sort order. Right now it's alphabetical, but you could sort it by when a book was updated or by word count also. Um, the last but not least, the really exciting thing is several of you on this uh, call represent some of the open source Pressbooks networks. So when we first released the Pressbooks directory, we were only including books from networks that we hosted. But in the last month, we've added, I think, six or seven of the really prominent open source networks who've worked with us. So we're really pleased that the BC campus books are now, Josie, thanks for working on it. You can now see all of BC campuses books. They have hundreds of really great books, including a huge chunk of the OpenStax books that they've worked really hard to bring in or remediate. So those are now included in the directory. Um, if you were to look for Alberta, so Michelle's network, we've got all of Alberta's books that they've included the list and they have some really terrific books on an open source hosted network. And then a lot of you know Billy Menke at Hawaii. So we've also added Hawaii's books here. Um, let me remove the Alberta ones and you can see here are some of the really cool books that Hawaii has brought in. Uh, and I know there's a few other open source networks that we've added that I'm forgetting right now. So thank you um, for working with us on those. And we're really excited to see that this number is over 2000 and growing. So hopefully you'll find the directory really useful and valuable for you. Um, the other thing that I wanna show is two things that we're working on that will be released pretty soon. One is, uh, let me close this and go to our Devin. So one is um, we're, we're going to be adding a kind of featured books. Ultimately, I think this will be featured collections. So above the fold, you'll have the ability to see some featured collections. And if you were to click a collection, it would aggregate a bunch of books on a certain topic. So we're going to build a, a collection that's all about open education, or we'll build a collection that's about uh, accessibility and inclusivity. We'll build a collection that's about uh, interactive OER, books that have a lot of H5P and that have been really well built. We could build an OpenStax collection, or we just have the ability to kind of aggregate books by collections. So, so that will be coming soon um, and will be a new facet and filter. The other thing that we're starting to do is we're going to be adding these little recommended tags or filters. We haven't yet sent an email out to everybody, but the idea would be that if books meet certain criteria, that we will recommend them and add this little recommended tag. It basically means that the book has good metadata and we think it's a complete book that might be broadly useful. We're gonna have really kind of, I think, pretty loose criteria for what gets put in as recommended, um, but that will be a new feature that's coming in the directory, this recommended, and then some featured books and featured collections. Um, those will be probably arriving in the next month or two, I think. Uh, and we also are gonna be doing a big kind of facelift and beautifying and redesigning the Pressbooks directory along with the relaunch of our marketing website. So it'll have a new look and feel, but the functionality will be pretty much preserved in the same. Okay, so uh, that's what I wanted to show for the directory. I'll pause there and take questions. I see some stuff in the chat. If anybody wants to unmute and ask stuff, I'm happy to take questions about what's happened with the directory or what is happening with the directory. I have a question that isn't really about the directory, but was kind of inspired by the directory. And I don't think I've brought it up here and I, I may have missed a meeting or two. So it may have come up as well in another one, but um, is there, are there any kind of OER guidelines around 
the publisher tag in metadata. Like what I discovered in looking through the directory um, is a lot of cloned books maintain the original publisher as part of the metadata. And is that really applicable? I guess is the big like philosophical question. Is it the same book? Uh, Cause we have a really popular book that I think has four or five clones now on the, that are all in the directory. And some of them show up as published by Ohio State, some don't. And I wonder if there's any kind of guideline that can be put in place to either like stop that from being transmitted to clone books or enforce it if that's what the yeah. community wants. Like, I, I really don't know what like the OER philosophical stance on this is. And it's a question that just was, we talked about it in the Unison meeting a few times, but I don't think we've I've, uh, brought it up here. It's come up here. That's a great, I haven't heard it discussed before, but my, I can, so it, to summarize what I think I'm understanding is you've made a book and your institution is the publisher of that book, but that book has an open license. Institution two clones this book and it's now published on their Pressbooks network, but it still lists your institution as the publisher. Correct. Let's say they make substantial revisions. They ought to probably change the publisher of that, but the default value is just whatever the value of the publisher that was set when it was cloned. So there's a couple things I think that we could do here. One would be we circulate some best practices and strongly encourage people to follow them and hope that they do. The other option is what we did recently was when we clone books, we no longer clone the ISBN, for example, because the ISBN needs to be unique. We could choose if we if people felt strongly like we could say when you clone a book, don't clone the publisher field. So a cloned book would have an empty publisher and would need to be supplied. I think if that was a problem for enough people, if they felt like, hey, we don't want to be listed as the publisher of derivatives, then that would be an easy enough change for us to make in our cloning routine. However, it wouldn't address books that have already been cloned with that metadata. Uh, I guess I'm open. Do other people have thoughts or ideas or feedback about that? What's the general consensus about what we ought to do? Yeah, I think for BC Campus, it would make sense for the publisher to not come through on cloned books. Like I know when we make, do adaptations, we become the publisher. Um, so that's kind of been always and been you, our practice. And you manually change that, right? You change that value before publishing. Yeah, but most of our adaptations haven't been through press books. It's been stuff we've brought into press books. But yeah, I do know there's lots of books in there where BC Campus is the publisher, but they're not in our instances anymore. Other people have taken and made the copies their own. Would anyone have strong objections if we removed, if we stopped cloning the publisher information for derivative books? Would that uh, cause problems or do you see any issues that might emerge from doing that? We'll say, I think that that just assumes that every time you clone a book, it's with the intention of creating a derivative work. But I know that lots of folks are like cloning over to their network to just have a specific link for their students or uh, to have you know, the LTI integration work. Um, and I wonder if that would affect people who are using the cloned feature just simply to have local copies uh, to distribute. I, I, I don't, I wouldn't know as somebody that's not teaching, but I imagine yeah, that, that, that there's more than, more than just creating derivative works that, so that to, would be a reason to clone a book. The thing that I'd be want, want to be thinking about is making sure that the attribution is still provided through other mechanisms. So we don't want, we certainly want to, the clone book should always give credit to the original and point to the attribution, but whether it indicates the same publisher of the clone book by default is a separate question. And um, thanks for bringing that up, Mike. I can turn that into a feature request and we can discuss that with a few more, a few more people in the press books world before we do something about that. Yeah, cool. Like, like I said, like, uh, I don't feel super strongly one way or the other about it. I, it's just the thing like I'm not even sure what the community thinks like <laughs> it's just something I noticed when looking through the directory and it just jumped out as a little odd. Yeah, uh, I've seen the same thing, you know, there's that guide to making open textbooks with students that's cloned on the like 300 networks and they all show Rebus as the publisher. Um, and Rebus may love that Rebus may not love that I don't know. <laughs> I've heard of may want to weigh in on that. We're with you, Steel, for us, all of the um, books that are published on our, on our network, something that we hold 
really dearly is that the creators hold copyright to those books. So in some cases, Rebus is the official publisher supplying the ISBN. In other cases, they're published out of another institution, but using the Rebus network. So for us, I think we're in favor of um, not having that piece of data um, copied over during clones. But I like Jonathan's suggestion in the chat, um, which says yeah. you could retain a statement that says original publisher for this cloned version was X. And that solves the attribution piece. And also, I guess, Lillian's comment about instructors who might be using the books as is for teaching. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, what's going to what's going to happen in many cases is that well, that's fine. I think there's going to be some weird metadata there where you're going to have a metadata entry that shows the publisher as this strange string, which is not, in fact, a actual publisher entity. But uh, <clears throat> OK, I think there might also be issues with exports. So that's something to consider there. Right. It will, yeah, it will appear on your publisher page as this weird name of a publisher. Yeah. OK, so there's something to think about there. Um, and that's a good point. Probably mentioning that in the workflow when you're adapting a clone book would be a good idea for us to provide to people, certainly at the very minimum, and maybe removing the publisher information upon clone or not cloning that as part of the book info. I saw a question earlier, though. This was from um, maybe not a question or a statement, but Amy and Lauren both said had questions about checklists for people. So, Amy, the, the question is like, how do I make sure, how do I know my book is going to look good or look right or have all the right information for the book directory if I'm summarizing? Is that kind of the, the question? Yeah, we did. Um, my um, program assistant and I did a pass through all the metadata on all the books in the network over the summer, um, but we weren't focusing on the things that would make the book show up in the directory how we want them like that radio button that you showed the on off in the directory um and then like subject headings and like what other things are there to look out for and just kind of like a, a checklist would help us go through all the books in the network in a more systematic way yes absolutely okay so our plan for this is so I, we we have at pressbooks we just brought on a practicum student from mcgill from the library program and he's specifically, I'm mentoring him and we're working on UX and user experience for the directory itself. And one of the big goals is he's working to help us develop this recommended books feature. And what we're drafting right now is some language for all network managers right now, which will say, hey, everyone, we'd like to bring, we're going to start doing this is recommended uh, feature. In order for your book to be recommended, here are the things that you should, it's going to be a checklist of metadata that we'd like to have in place or to have considered. Once that has been done, then a book is eligible to be a recommended book. So we will be providing that via email, hopefully in the next month. That's his like next project to be working on. Um, and and then we can publish that and you can share that and kind of circulate. It'll be, we'll try to keep it brief and try to keep it doable, but it will be like book info metadata suggestions to make a book most findable in the directory. So that's exactly what we have in mind. And I'm glad that that would be helpful for you. Or I hope it will be helpful for you. Do you fear, do you fear that like a year, two years down the road, 80% of them will end up being recommended? <laughs> no, I think that'd be great. <laughs> is that, or that's the goal. That's the point. Or that's the yeah, goal. I mean, and, and, and ultimately, like, this is a light recommendation, you know, like, depending on what you're looking for, some people are not looking for a finished book. Some people are looking for like, I want something that I can quickly revise and remix and I, anything is better than nothing. Or maybe you want to make a Frankenstein book. And so you're looking for parts of something to cannibalize. We, we can't know what a user is intention is when they come to the directory, but we can make, we can, for recommendations, we can say, at least we know that these books meet some kind of basic metadata criteria. We're not, we're, we're, we don't need to be a gatekeeper as to the content quality or the expertise in the book that's for others to decide. But certainly in terms of like a metadata threshold, we can say, yeah, this book has met some kind of basic standards um, and now users can make their own uh, decisions about whether they'd like to use, adopt, or otherwise modify it. I think that's our, our kind of our company's intention. <laughs> yeah, Jonathan, if we can make that. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's a, it's a semantic uh, nomenclature issue. 
take it up with our comms marketing people, Jonathan, if you want to make the argument for well meta decorated. I'm not sure that that's going to be a, the, the term of art that's chosen. <laughs> Um, anybody else have questions about uh, the directory or things that we you saw in the product update today? This isn't so much a question, but sort of related. Um, I just put in the chat that, like at UW, we I when I'm talking with a faculty member and I know that they're creating a book in press books, and I know that it's going to be an OER or very close or an open pedagogy project that might not be fully OER, but meet certain criteria, then um, under my discretion, we add it to our featured titles catalog, which is like the Pressbooks catalog on our homepage. And then we also get those catalogs in our um, Ex Libris libraries catalog. Um, and so I'm kind of curious what, like how, how that will end up um, intersecting with the recommended titles for the directory. Um, and similarly, or sort of related, I'm working on a template chapter right now. I've been working with a lot of classes where students are authoring books and press books. And um, I wonder if anybody else is doing this where you have a sort of template chapter with media attributions and citations and sort of the formatting that you might want students to do for a chapter um, and uh, to keep consistency in the book. Um, so I'm sort of working on that to give to students who are authoring chapters in press books along with like a checklist um, or maybe like a templated thing for faculty to fill out the book info page just to make it like very easy for them to have consistency and um, make yeah. things look pretty. <laughs> so Lauren, those are all great ideas. What, what, what we're hoping to do with this US pra UX practicum student is I'd like him to do like a survey or focus group with some of the library and users to say like, what should we improve about book info and th these exact kinds of questions. So I expect that many of you will probably send you an invitation to join his survey group or hopefully contribute a little bit of time um, or filling out a survey to help us understand your needs and uses a bit better. One thing that we are doing that's sort of imperceptible, but I'll, we had thought about this. So with your question, Lauren, about indicating in the directory whether a book was in its network's catalog or not, initially we were doing it with color and we were doing it a bit bolder. But if you look here, it's very, very faint but this book has a plain white card background and this one has a light, very light blue. That's indicating actually whether the book is in the, the its network's catalog or it is not. The problem again is that every network has different practices for what they put in their catalog and what they don't. Some don't even use the catalog feature at all and some use it religiously. So the question for us is, because the signal isn't universal, making a universal decision in our director design wasn't super helpful. The other thing that we were thinking about doing is what I would like is right now we have a visual indicator that shows you the copyright license. Like this means all rights reserved. This is a book from Lauren, from your network that cannot be cloned because it's all rights reserved, but it's still a useful book. It could be taught with, it could be adopted. It just couldn't be revised and remixed. Um, one idea is to have a little like you maybe have some kind of symbol with color. Maybe it's a, a border that's red that shows you quickly visually not eligible for cloning. Again, those those signs don't have intrinsic meaning. So we would need to decide what the right indicator is, which indicators should be included, and then provide some kind of code or key for interpreting them. Um, the, the very next thing that we're planning to do is to build like a it's called a product tour. And it's basically just an optional overlay that says take a tour and what it will be is it'll be like a little focus on the search bar and we'll explain how the search bar works and then we'll focus on the license bar and shows how that works and then it focuses on the book card and kind of interprets the book card for users that's the next kind of thing we're hoping to build just to make the directory a bit more user friendly and explain some of the more complex features for people who may not be accustomed to search tools like this um, and in the course of doing that, of course, we'll need feedback from you and others about what worked and what didn't. Um, 
so again, yeah, we have a bunch of UX things we'd like to do and uh, slowly chipping away. And maybe next month we'll have more to show on that front. Um, I know that I've left it a little bit tight, but um, usually we try to have a little round table where others of you share things that you're working on, questions that you have, accomplishments that you're proud of. Uh, I'm gonna turn the recording off and let us do that round table. If anybody has something they'd like to share, go for it. 